Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I'm Laura Brown. I'm an educational psychologist, and I have been working in some capacity in this industry for 25 to 30 years, so that's a really <laughs> long time. I've, uh, I've done research and curriculum and educational consulting and even worked as a creative executive. All of that to say that when I see something that's a really innovative approach to supporting children through storytelling, I, I sit back and I take notice because there aren't that many innovative approaches. And that's exactly what happened when Kim Howitt, who I worked with at Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, brought Aya Caspi in to work on nonviolent communication on two of the shows that we were working on. It was a very radical way of supporting children through storytelling. So that's what the panel is gonna talk about today. We all work together at Warner Brothers Discovery on two different shows where nonviolent communication was integrated into the storytelling. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to really roll up our sleeves today. We are going to dig in. We're going to show you the actual scripts. We're going to show you Aya's notes. And we're going to show you the revision process until we even get to the final clip. And the reason why we're going so deep into this is because the changes are very subtle. They are language tweaks. But those little tweaks made a huge difference in how children felt listen to and the degree of empathy and it really made a transformative feeling in the actual storytelling. So we didn't think that we could really explain this without you seeing the language tweaks and that's what we're going to show to you today. So um, I just want to start by introducing, these are like my buddies, so <laughs> it's the panel but they're also my buddies and I'm so excited that they're here with me. So um, this is Aya Caspi, she's a certified non violent communication trainer. She brings the transformative power of NVC to schools and colleges, parenting groups, couples counseling, nonprofit organization, and children's media in the U.S. and internationally. So that just gives you a sense of the broad applicability of her work. We're going to be looking at preschool shows today, but I want you to think about all the other places that this is being applied. This is Kim Howitt. She's an executive producer with over 25 years of experience in creative development, long and short form content, live action and animation. Kim is currently head of development at Trustbridge Entertainment. She's worked with industry leaders such as Hidden Pigeon Company, of course, Warner Brothers Discovery, HBO, Apple TV, this is a very long list, Nickelodeon, <laughs> Disney, HarperCollins, just to name a few. And at the end here, we have Nuria Gonzalez Blanco. She's a writer, director, and Academy Award nominated producer. She's worked across television, film, and advertising, and she's the creator and director of Silly Sundays, which is one of the shows that we're going to show you guys today. Um, yeah, so let's get started because we have a lot of material that we want to get you through. So I don't know if, uh, let's just see a show of hands. Have people heard of nonviolent communication? Okay, yeah, so it's out there. It's definitely out there. I just want to start so we're all sort of on the same page. Can you give us a summary of what nonviolent communication is? Yes, of course. So nonviolent communication is a body of work that was developed by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg back in the 60s when he was working in Southern California on racial integration. And it was his attempt to bring the principles of nonviolence into the way we communicate. And he specifically wanted to name it nonviolent communication to trace it back to this tradition of nonviolence from Martin Luther King and the his movement, the, the Freedom Rights Movement, and Gandhi in India. It actually translates into Sanskrit, um, to the word ahimsa, which means a complete absence of intention to harm, including those who harm us. So it's really the antidote of eye for an eye. And when I was introduced to it in 2007, it completely transformed my life because it was the first time I was introduced to a teaching that was assuming innocence on behalf of humans, assuming that 
every choice of ours as humans is motivated by one or more of our universal human needs, which is exit point from right-wrong thinking and judgmental thinking. It also assumes that we are interdependent, and so we have an innate need to care for each other, because our well-being and the well-being of others is one and the same. And it assumes that we are all designed to collaborate. Our brains are designed to collaborate together to find solutions that work for everyone, provided that we feel that um, our needs matter and that we have choice. Does How? this give you a little bit? <laughs> yeah. It does. <laughs> It's a powerful framework, a powerful framework. So, Kim, just to make the bridge a little bit here, you knew of Aya's work. Yes. And you were working on a preschool show, and you saw a connection. Can you just walk us through that? Yeah, so I was familiar with Aya's work, and when I started at HBO, we had just put a show into production called Lou and the Bally Bunch, a charming show about a group of little bugs and their first preschool experience. And I was reading the pilot script, and it was a story about why we don't bring our home toys to school. And so, of course, the main character is very attached to her home toy, and she sneaks it into her classroom, and the teacher finds it and says, I'm going to put this up in a special place to keep it safe. And another little character sees it and is very tempted and curious. And although he knows the rule, he breaks the rule to play with it, and it rolls under a piece of furniture, and drama ensues. Will they ever get it back? And of course they do, and it ends very with a happy ending. And it's charming and funny and lovely, and when I was reading the script, it really felt like it was a story written by adults to teach kids why we need to follow this rule and essentially to obey. And when I, what I felt was missing from the story was the connection to these characters who felt so compelled to break the rules, who were sneaking in their treasured possessions into class, or so curious to discover something new that they chose to break a rule. And that's our audience. And they felt left out from the story. And I really wanted to connect with the innocent needs of the children, the characters, and sometimes I think in preschool, with all the great intentions we have, we're teaching kids to follow rules. And so I felt like Aya's work was the perfect match, and I brought her in, and it just snowballed from there. She came in on many shows, and that's what we'll talk about. <laughs> okay, awesome. So I, you've talked um, about the domination structures that are so pervasive in our culture, and I know that that is the basis for what um, NBC is the antidote to. So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go through those traditional domination structures just a little bit. Uh, and I know you have a slide. Yeah. Here you go. And this is a bit a lot. Bear with me. And we're going to um, show you a very specific example later on with the script. So if we have a, every society has a story about humans and what we are here for, and it seems like our society in general has a story that humans are somewhat bad, wrong, sinners. They need to be controlled. We cannot trust them. And that seems to be reflected in the way we speak in our language. Because if we want to affect change, uh, we would need to use control and obedience to um, motivate people. And so these domination structures are embedded in the language in many forms. Some of them are here. Uh, one big one is moralistic judgments. Is the idea that there is a right thing to do, a wrong thing to do. If you do, you're doing the right thing, then you deserve a reward. If you're doing the bad thing, you deserve punishment. And judgments are very costly uh, because they support separation from our own humanity and the humanity of others. Um, and specifically for children's brain, it's very alarming because we need belonging and we need to trust that we are loved. And it can be very subtle. Even this weekend, I had a parents visit us for dinner with their year and a half years old. Um, and they were talking about her saying, in a very playful way, she's bossy and she doesn't have boundaries, and this can be very subtle, but at the same time our kids in 
internalize that sense of self if they hear it often enough, and it doesn't matter if it's a positive judgment or a negative la judgment. And there is a subtle separation, which creates eventually a sense of fragility in who we are. Um, and one other way that we use judgment is towards ourselves. So we teach our children to judge themselves because we induce shame and guilt. For example, um, when we force children to apologize and say sorry, as if they're doing something bad wrong without them being seen for the needs they're trying to meet with their choices. Many times when children are trying to advocate for the needs, they will be told by adults that they are talking back. And so there is a, a sense of they need to oppress their experience. Uh, denial of responsibility shows in the way that we imply that our kids or other people cause our experience. When we say to others, you make me hang ang angry or you hurt my feelings. And the truth is that our experience is stimulated internally by our needs or by our perception of what happens, not by what other people are doing. And it's very disempowering to believe that other people cause our experience because then we give our power away to others, the power to make us wrong. So responsibility brings the power back. Denial of choice, shoulds and have tos while telling kids what they can or cannot do. Um, it's, it's a subtle way to uh, create oppression when we don't honor other people's choice, basically when we expect obedience. And we internalize this, so we have internal shoulds. It's very common in our language. And I would just say the last thing, deserve thinking, which is if you do the right thing, you deserve a punishment, and if you do the wrong thing, if you backwards, if you do the right thing, you deserve a reward. If you do the wrong thing, you deserve punishment. And we try to shift with NVC into natural consequences versus artificial consequences, because when we do that, we support children in being motivated externally by trying to avoid the punishment or seeking the reward versus doing things because they meet their own needs. I know that was a lot. It was great. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at that list, it's, it's so many things that I naturally do. I mean, it's how I was raised. It's almost unconscious, right? And so we need someone like Aya to show us what is unconscious, make it conscious, and shift it just a little bit. And it's so empowering. And that's what we're going to show you now. So the first show that we're going to talk about is um, Silly Sundays. Here's the beautiful artwork. This was um, created and directed by Nuria Gonzalez Blanco. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the show. Thanks, Dora. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, uh, Silly Sundays. So Silly Sundays is a feel good uh, preschool comedy show. And it's very rooted in the themes of family, uh, learning to play, and um, being yourself without fear of ridicule or judgment. And in the series, we join uh, the adventures of Sonia, her cousin uh, Ugo, and her sister Mel, as they create the loads of uh, full of heart memories with their family and friends every Sunday, as it says in the title. And we, we just have the opening clip, so you guys get a feel for it. Okay. So <laughs> take a bow, Nuria. <laughs> so um, the first story that we're going to talk about required a real shift from the domination structures that Aya was just discussing. Um, it's called Crab's New Home. Just give us like the log line, set it up. Yeah, so in this episode, uh, Sonia, Ugo, and Mel are building this uh, home for a crab at the beach. And they work really hard on it, and they think it's amazing, they're so proud of it, they show it to the crab, and nope, the crab is not interested at all. So uh, Sonia even nudged the crab a little bit to make it go into the house, and the crab is not happy about that. She gets really frustrated, and when Granny comes in, uh, Sonia shares all her frustrations with her. Yeah. So um, yeah, 
So after Granny enters the scene, Sonia explains what happens. I'm just going to read it with you guys. So Sonia, I was helping. It was being cheeky and rude. And Granny says, you know, if we touch somebody when they don't want us to, then we're being rude too, aren't we? Sonia grimaces. She knows Granny's right. So what was your reaction, Aya, to this early draft of the script? Yeah, so here we see you know, that Son Sonia is doing what she was taught to do, which is when our needs are not being met, we find what's wrong with others or, you know, outside of us versus connecting with our needs. And so she's using here judgmental language, which implies wrongness on behalf of the crab. And in um, response, Granny is judging Sonia for being judgmental. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the cycle of shame and guilt. And uh, it's very costly. Marsha Rosenberg said that behind every judgment there is, uh, that there is a need, a human need. So instead, Granny could just connect with the needs behind Sonia's distress or pain and model to her um, how to stay connected to her vulnerability. And it's kind of, um, yeah, ironic that we're trying to teach non-judgment by judging. <laughs> that, 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 will, that will repeat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to show you how it changed eventually, but we just want to show you a little bit later in the scene. The scene continued, and there were some other key NBC insights that um, Annie applied. Uh, Aya, sorry, Aya applied. So <laughs> mm. <laughs> Let, let's just look at this. Um, so the scene continues, and Granny says, and what do, we say, what do we say about touching when someone doesn't want us to? Hugo, we don't do it. Sonia, don't do it. Granny, that's right. So if somebody says no, we, Hugo, just let it go. And, and what were your further yeah. notes on this? So this is, again, the socialization process in action, teaching obedience. You know, all kids want to belong and want to be loved. And of course, when you have a fi figure like Granny, whom the kids love so much, they want to do the right thing. And so they fall, but there is a, um, a really cost here of, of connecting with the why. You know, why would we want to do, um, offer consent to others? There's no connection with that. And there's also this use of, adults referring to kids as we, pre presenting like, this is what we do, which is um, subtle coercion. It's not really what we do, uh, it's what granny wants them to do. And there's no owning of that. Yeah, she's just treading softly, but still trying to get the child to comply. So, so this is how it was changed. Almost done. Bucket, warm sand, squishy seaweed, sparkling pebbles. Wait, wait. And the swimming pool. Nice shell, Sonia. Crab's new home is ready. Whoa. Hello, Crab. We made you a new home. Ta-da. Oh, maybe he likes this crowded, cold, noisy home. Or maybe he can't find the door to his new home. I'll help you, Crab. This way, over here. Stop, stop. Oh, wait, wait. No, no, no. Stop, Crab. I don't think that's a good idea, Sonia. Ah. The water is perfect to cool melons today. Oh, nice sand castle. We made a new home for a crab, but he didn't like it. And he didn't like when I touched him, Granny. I see. You wanted to help the crab find a new home. Would you like a hug? If you say no, that's OK. Yes! Oh, I hear a yes. Here comes the hug. <laughs> Oh, we didn't ask the crab if he wanted a new home. And he didn't ask and I touched him, Granny. I imagine the crab wants to choose where to live. Look, the crab is back. 
Would you like a new home, Crab? If you want it. He doesn't want to live in the bucket, but he wants the shiny shell for his own home. Bye bye, bye crab. crab. <laughs> 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 That's nice. Um, so, I don't know about you guys, but I just kind of feel like, ah, oh, with that scene, right? <laughs> just really kind of resonates. Um, how, how for you, Nuria, how does that, how was that different? How did it resonate with you, the resolution? Well, for me, especially in this scene and this episode, one thing that I love is how we um, managed to get this power balance between Granny, who is an adult, and the children, the kids. So, of course, from the very start, for, for me, like we, I mean, we always try to get this... Um, environment that was going to be non-patronizing and caring and respectful, of course. Uh, and for me, it was very, very important that Granny wouldn't tell the kids what to do, but instead we'd create a space where they could find out the solutions by themselves and she would just help them to do that. So uh, these, like, thanks to I just super detailed notes because she sent them with so much care and explained so much everything so you would really understand what it, why this makes it more connecting and more powerful? Uh, it just we didn't just achieve that; we actually elevated it. Like I, I find that is, uh, yeah, it was a very complicated uh, scene with loads of themes and load of little uh, learnings, and that just was beautifully done. Thanks to Ayan and VC. Mm -hmm. you have anything to add, Aya? Yeah, I just love how there is this field of innocence that I was mentioning. The, we didn't hear that no one is doing anything bad or wrong. Everyone's needs are being seen and acknowledged. Sonia's the crab. And there is a teaching of consent with modeling and embodiment versus, you know, preaching and mm. judgment. Mm -hmm. It feels very different and very respectful of the child. And effective. It's effective education. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so we want to show you a second story. Uh, hmm. Let's see here. Yeah. Okay, so um, this next one is about something that is very pervasive in our culture, and it's apologies. I, I was thinking about how many times I said sorry today, and it was in the double digits, people. <laughs> 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 it was a lot. So, um, can you set up the story, uh, the yeah. story for us, here? Yeah. yeah. Stay with me on this one. So, <laughs> Sonia, Sonia, Hugo, and Mel are trying to figure out why Sonia's mechanical yellow duck toy is not working. <laughs> Someone repeats this later. I'll give them something. <laughs> um, and uh, what's happening is that um, at some point, Hugo actually tells Sonia that he thinks that Ducky, as she calls it, is broken. And she gets like really emotionally like, and says like, you're broken. Was like, uh oh, that's tough. Uh, so he feels a little bad about that. And to cheer her up, he paints uh, his purple duck toy, yellow, and give it to her. So, ooh, now it's working. Uh, that said, Sonia realizes that that's not her duck and gets extra disappointed. So, the next scene that we're going to talk about is when they're trying to make amends. Yeah. So, I know that as the educational consultant on shows, I've said, okay, the child needs to apologize. The child's done something wrong. Can we get an apology here? And, and that's what happened in the early draft of the script. So, um, Sonia scoots over, inviting Hugo to sit beside her. He does. They exchange a smile, and Hugo says, I'm sorry, Sonia. I really wanted to help. And Sonia accepts the apology. I know. I'm sorry, too. So, what was your take on that? Yeah. So... The word sorry, which we repeat, like we said, so many times a day, is intended to express care for the impact of our choices on others. But many times it misses that in the delivery because um, there is a certain expectation that if we say sorry, it will just be fixed. It doesn't really deliver the understanding for the impact that the person who's been impacted is need, in needs to be heard. And in NBC, we always offer an antidote 
So we wanted to deliver the care without the shame and the guilt and the cost of separation from self or from the hum humanity. And we just shift to acknowledgement of impact without shame and without guilt. And that can be very simple and very powerful and actually contributes to healing much more. Yeah. Okay. So let's see how it, it played out in the show. Quack, quack. <laughs> you know, I really wanted to cheer you up. I know. Painting my duck like ducky didn't help. I like my ducky. I know. <laughs> Look, my hand is yellow. I can help you wash it, if he wants. You're not broken. Granny! <laughs> 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 so, so, Nuria, I know that you've spoken about how this note in particular was really a breakthrough for the show. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Well, like you, I mean, I say sorry like 50 times a day. It's, <laughs> it's just something that I, I, I'm, as I, I call it, like I have like this language baggage that I grew, I grew up with this. I mean, I, I was uh, told that this was the way that you will be polite, that you will be good, that you, you know what you. So, um, what I realized is that just because it feels natural doesn't. I mean, it's the strongest way to actually for a for a most effective communication. It's uh, it's, it's not really, and that's something that's been for NVC and well, thanks to Aya, like we um, we work on that. And I uh, I feel I'm delighted that I'm not passing that baggage to new generations. Really glad about that. And we found uh, a way, and not just with the stories, but with many things, we found ways to. To, um, for the characters to express their, their needs, their wants, their feelings, um, that it was more connecting and without compromising their authenticity. And, and it, still, it still felt very genuine. So, um, I, I, I mean, it was, this show was the uh, Broken Ducky was the first script of 78. So, um, it, it really set the tone for the whole show and it opened this very exciting way of, of working and uh, um, also just as a bonus, it, it didn't just work, out, work for the show, it worked for my own life as well because I learned so much and I could apply all this learning in my, in my daily, daily basis. So yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is really great. Anything else about apologies? I think I, I want to add that yeah, we try to um, be seen for our intention to care, right? Hugo here wanted to be seen, that he was trying to help. But that shifts the attention to him being seen versus focusing on the impact on Sonia. And so we found this very s simple language. We, we all kind of needed to find very age-appropriate language, just saying, you know, um, what I did didn't help. And that provided the acknowledgement without him having to make himself wrong. Mm -hmm. Subtle, but powerful. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now I want to um, switch gears. We're going to talk about a second show called Lou and the Valley Bunch. Kim, you served as executive producer and you brought Aya in to consult on this one as well. Um, let me get the, the Lou stuff here. Can you tell us a little bit about the show? Um, so it's what I said, and this is the show I was referring to at the top of the discussion. It's about these little bugs and all the drama that happens in preschool, these first experiences when you're no longer at home with your parents, and there's lots of personalities coming together and clashing. Yep, and we'll just show you the opening song here. Hey, I'm Ladybird Lou with Go Strickland. Bye bye! I'm gonna be too. Lou and the Valley Bunch. 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 Okay, so we're going to start with a story um, that gives space for emotions, which is very central to NVC. It's called Down in the Grumps. Kim, can you set it up for us? Yeah, it's a, 
Declan is in a grumpy mood. He comes to class. He comes to preschool in this mood. And our, our goal really was, from the beginning of this episode, to express the idea that it's okay to have all the moods and the full range of emotion is accepted. But we found when we were writing the script with those intentions that we were still sending a message that wasn't what we intended. So I think if you want to go to the yeah. Yeah. first Let, part. Let's show you the early draft of the script. So Lou says, Declan, Barnaby says he's going to just let you be grumpy until you cheer up on your own. Maybe I'll do that too. And Declan says, okay. So Aya, what was your reaction to the language there? Um, I'm kind of relating to what Kim was saying. I think that was the overall theme in our project, that the intention is always to deliver care, deliver empathy, um, support kids in having their emotions, but then our language doesn't deliver that intention. And here we see how powerful is socialization is, that this kind of expectation to cheer up was creeping in. Uh, it was so hard to just accept that Declan is grumpy and not to try to change that in any way. And I wanted that. I wanted that radical acceptance for him. Yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to do because you want people to feel better. So, so the and language creeps in. this is about us, in. not about them. This is the discomfort That's that right. we feel with the other person's unhappiness. unhappiness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what's interesting about this example in particular is that even as they revised and they tried to get out of some of that pressured language, not intentionally pressured, but it was putting pressure on Declan, it was very hard to get rid of. And so we're going to show you a next draft of a script. And just, just put yourself in Declan's position here, okay? And, and we're speaking to you, Declan, and you're in a, a really grumpy mood. And see if you can feel that unintentional pressure. So Lou says, Declan, how about Barnaby and I play Radish right here next to you? And Declan says, I'm still grumpy. And Lou says, uh-huh, I know. I'd still like to play near you, though. Barnaby says, me too. Declan says, OK. And Lou says, really? Yay. And Declan says, I think that maybe I'm actually only feeling mostly grumpy now. And Lou says, you can be happy or grumpy or mostly grumpy, whatever you want to feel. So there's still some unintentional pressure here. What was it? Well, Aya. here we see that when um, Declan's peers are now shifted into this kind of acceptance, there is the internal pressure. Now he has this, um, some, some sort of discomfort in, inside of, of himself with feeling grumpy and trying to say, well, I'm feeling mostly grumpy and, and leaving space for, for him to change. And I wanted to model also him feeling comfortable with himself and not having any internalized pressure. Uh, the other thing I saw here is this language about whatever you want to feel, which can be subtle, again, implying that we choose what we want to feel. You know, okay, if you want to feel grumpy, feel grumpy. But the truth is that we don't choose our feelings. Our experience is stimulated from inside of us by our needs, by our perception. And so I want that language to just be, you know, uh, it's okay for you to feel it just because you feel it. Yeah, yeah. Because this is what is. Yeah. Okay, so here is where we landed. Does Declan still feel grumpy? Yes, he does. We're just going to give him a little room to let him be grumpy. Thanks. How about Barnaby and I radish right right over here? We don't have to stop you being grumpy, and I'd still like to play near you. Me too. Okay, I'd like to have you play near me. Really? Yay! Come on, Lou. On your mark, get set, race. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> 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 feelings are feelings, feel what's right for you Whether a smile or a frown, feeling up or down Feel what's real for you You might feel a little bit <sighs> Feel a little bit Yippee! Feel a little bit right for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that.
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Kim, I know that you have I to know. love this clip. Any reactions? I, lo I love this clip because at the end, he just flops down on his back. It's not like we're waiting for the moment where he cheers up. And he's there being held, not like, go off to the grumpy corner where you have your room to be grumpy. He's part of the community, and he's grumpy till the end. And I think that that really models what we were trying to get across. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and, and such a relief for the person who's grumpy, that they can just, you know, feel what they're feeling. Um, okay, so the last one that we want to talk about is a story called Goodbye Rainbows. This is, is a story where there were shoulds, and shoulds are demands, if you think back to that first slide that um, I was telling you about. So can you set it up for us? Yeah, I think this one's going to be tricky for those of you who are parents out there. But I think it's a really <laughs> juicy one. And this is a story about Lou... She's outgrown her galoshes, rain boots, and it's raining, and she's really attached to these rain boots. I mean, she does not want to give them up. They don't fit her. They hurt. They're popping open. There's holes in them. And the approach of connecting to her distress about her attachment to these boots was the direction we took instead of, it's time to get new boots. So why don't we go through it, because I think it's a yeah. fun one, and it'll, it'll bring up a lot of things. Yeah. So, so the should was there right from the beginning. I mean, I, I think this is taken from the premise, but there it is. Dad tells Lou she should put on her rain boots. It's wet out there. What was your reaction? Well, should implies that uh, Lou has no choice, and that is typically the beginning of a power struggle. And working with parents, I've seen it all. These power struggles are so costly. And by the time our kids reach adolescence, they just learn how to rebel and use the power over others in the same way. So the whole idea of creative disobedience is that we want to create an invitation for kids to feel safe to say no to a power figure um, and trust that our kids have a need for care and for contribution, just like any other human. And it's actually a shifting to a paradigm of from distrust to trust. We don't have to control. Right. Right. And if you think about when they're all grown up, of course you want them to be able to say no. And it starts here, right? Exactly. It starts in this early relationship. So there was revision, but as you've seen, it was a process. There was still subtle demand language in what came next. So Lou runs through a puddle. Dad notices that Lou isn't looking pleased. He checks in with her. Lou, everything all right? Oh, dear, is that a hole in your boot? I think it really is time for new ones, Lou. And your reaction, Aya, was? Well, even though there's no use of the word should here or have to, when you have a dad saying to a preschooler, I think it is really time for you, that's <laughs> kind of the same. Um, it's going to make it really hard for Lou to say no, and children are just faced with this dilemma, either submit or rebel, and both are reactive. Submission would lead to disconnecting from our own truth, and oppression of that, and, and res resentment about that, and at some point maybe, you know, depression in the long run. And rebellion is also costly because it's not conscious choice, it's, it's reactive, and it means I'm, I'm disconnecting from the other person, I'm just gonna say no, no matter what. So there is another way. There is another way, which is choosing to empathize with the needs behind the no, and start a dialogue and trust that we're going to come up with a solution that cares for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you're going to see here in the clip. Why are you running like that? Oh, my boots pinch so much. It feels like little dinosaurs are eating my toes. Oh, what about just a normal splash? Yeah. <gasps> oh, no! Lou, everything all right? <gasps> oh, dear. Is that a hole in your boot? I'm guessing that means a very wet sock, too. 
Are you sure you don't need new boots? It's only a very small hole. It's actually not that small. Well, my sock is only a little wet. My dinosaur boots are the best. And I don't want new ones. Oh, Lou, you love your dinosaur boots so much, you'll want to keep wearing them forever. Yeah, forever and ever and ever. We'd best be going. See you at the Teapot Cafe later. Bye! <laughs> Hi, Lou. Hi. Hi, Declan. Hi, Dermot. It's a splashy day, isn't it, Lou? Yeah! <laughs> <gasps> Lou! What happened, love? so sad when you outgrow something you love. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So <laughs> <laughs> cute, scene. So, I love Dad's empathy there. That is the parent that I want to be all the time. <laughs> but I'm going to play devil's advocate. That's not always the parent that you can be because in life, there are health and safety concerns. There are time pressures. Let's say, instead, it was freezing cold out. It's snowing. He need, Dad needs her to get on her coat. She doesn't want to put on her coat because she's wearing like a beautiful new dress and she wants everybody to see the dress. And Dad has a meeting that he's presenting at and he <laughs> needs to get there on time. Okay? So, so that's like real life. Um, what would NBC say in that situation? I love this question. Bring it on. Um, you know, nonviolence is neither coercion or permissiveness. So we are not advocating for dropping the parents' needs. We need to find a way to care for everyone. And choice is a very deep need. And so we need to be aware that when we choose to use our power over our kids, um, what the cost might be. And I would say, you know, we are, we are capable of living with unmet needs. It's not like our kids cannot have um, unmet need from, from time to time. They're going to survive, but what we need is to make sure that they trust that their needs matter. And I tell parents there is the, the green, the yellow, and the red. In the red, all of us are going to have things that we're not open to dialogue about. When my daughter was a baby, you know, putting her in a seat car in a, with a seat belt, she used to cry. She didn't like it. And I would just tell her, yeah, I, you don't want to be locked in this uh, seat. And I love you so much that I'm not open to even one hair to fall from your head um, and any harm cause. So if we choose language that delivers directly the need we're trying to meet behind our demands, that helps. And also acknowledge the impact of the demands and, 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 and mourn that. And then we, in, in the yellow, we're going to have all the, the things that we engage with our kids in collaboration, and the more we cultivate that sense of choice for them, the more trust there is. And in the green, as our kids grow up, we just hand to them more and more choice without having to be in dialogue. Yeah. I love that metaphor of the, of the it's like a traffic light. And be aware that just the, in terms of effectiveness, you know, the, the repair work that we need to do when we engage in power struggle takes a lot of time and energy too. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, okay, so um, I can tell that Kim and Nuria are sold on this system. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we work with big teams. Kim, what was the reaction of the rest of the team? The impact of this work on the writers and the animators and the producers was so profound that they all wanted to speak at this panel. <laughs> and instead we put them on tape. <laughs> and they can and we can have their own words expressed. Okay. <laughs> all right, so here's the rest of the team. We developed a series around the themes of communication and conflict resolution. Basically, 
diplomatic relations for preschoolers. Being guided by the principles of nonviolent communication led us to think a lot about the way that we use language in preschool. And what Aya encouraged us to do was expand this scope beyond conflict resolution to conflict engagement and uh, empowered communication. So conventions that we see in stories with conflict, like saying you're sorry or giving praise or admonishments are, we realize, loaded with meaning that we were largely unaware of because it's language that we use all the time. A simple phrase like, I'm sorry, but, or even something like, great job. Those are actually laden with unintentional judgment. So saying sorry is a classic one that in preschool, we are used to writing that characters say sorry all the time because they misstep and then they want to apologize. Um, and Aya really helped us to think about this word and the fact that the words sorry and apologies tend to be loaded with a sense of wrongness or guilt or shame in our culture. Um, so we tried it a different way. So instead of a character saying sorry, the character would connect a little more deeply to their feelings by saying, for instance, I feel sad about making a splodge on your painting, or I feel sad that I yelled at you. Aya encouraged us to think about conflict as always arising when needs aren't being heard. And this allowed us to focus in on how our characters would express and identify their needs and ask for what they need. And then also, of course, to learn how to ask and understand what others need and ask it using language without judgment and with empathy. So these were all really preschool relatable problems. And we saw kids in research really shift from focusing on judging the characters, like you'd sometimes hear them say, he's so mean or he behaved badly, to now focusing on what happens in the situation. Hello. Granny! What I like most about this project uh, and about Granny in particular is the way kids are treated. Granny always listens to them and they always can come up with solutions um, in a creative way all together. The specific language ensures characters' experiences are acknowledged always with kindness and empathy and never dismissal. So once we got the hang of this, it was amazing how creative solutions to the conflicts in our stories really arose. I could tell you it also really worked on our team. And I know that we've all really taken on NVC into our own lives. Aya always does remind us that it's a practice and we're so thankful that she was able to teach us. Feeling what's right for you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, I hope you're inspired by NBC. You read more about it, use it in your own lives and in the shows and the stories that you're telling. Thank you.